Thank you, Mr. McLean. And g'day, brethren. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in the faith. Well, what a treat for me to be here with you today. Indianapolis, the famous Indianapolis. They gave us a, a schedule for when uh, we would, this would all be happening. And you know how things are so far off. And then uh, eventually time ticks by and it has come to this, standing here before you. And thank you for your warm and smiling faces. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be here today to give you a message that I hope will be encouraging and uh, as it was for me to put, put it together. It's good to see Mr. Wes Curlin here in front and center. He heard me speak in Alaska because Mandy, my wife, is from Alaska and he still came today. So I really appreciate that show of, of faith, Mr. Curlin. I have put a, a few slides together to try and keep you awake. We'll see how it works. Um, we've got Mike up the back there. He'll, um, he'll make it all good, I'm sure. A number of years ago, I purchased a new laptop. Probably many of you have one. And there's always that first day of setting it up. You know, you press the button and you hope that everything's going to come together, but it often doesn't, as you would well know. And I started the process of getting it ready for use. And I was so excited because I, was, I knew that I'd be able to take this laptop with me to Perth. And we live on the Gold Coast, which is on the east side of Australia. We had to fly across to Perth to present a sermon over there and be with some of the brethren. It was about a five-hour flight, five and a half hours. So it's like going from, I guess, New York to Los Angeles. Yes, it's a pretty big, big flight. Well, the setup was proceeding well when, as part of the installation of Microsoft Office, I was asked to insert my password. I tried to get around this because I could not remember for the life of me what it was. I tried uninstalling the operating system and I had some disks from previous versions with, you know, how they had those codes, long 20 codes with letters and numbers. And I uninstalled, I put it back in, I uninstalled, and I kept going back to this, uh, please insert your password. I called Microsoft, I told them the situation, and they said, we can certainly help you, but we'll need your password. <laughs> I opened up a secret file in another computer that contained all of the passwords from my life. Probably you've got one on your computer as well, right? Every single password. Not this one. No, no hope. I went around and around on this for most of the night. The, um, the Odyssey started about 6.30 in the evening, turned into 7.30, turned into 8.30, 9.30. 10.30, I became more and more agitated. I had to work the next day and then this flight and anyway, things were, were bearing down on me. I considered all the ramifications of the situation and the options at hand. I guess I would just have to purchase another version of uh, Microsoft Office, but that was, you know, 250 bucks, something like that. Why do that when, you know, you've already got access to it, if only you can get the password. As I say, 8 p.m. became 9, became 10, became 11. You know how computer problems can take up massive amounts of time. It's nothing to spend a day trying to solve a computer issue. And it feels like such a waste of time, doesn't it? If only the thing would work and it could just do what I'd, I'd be in and out of there in, you know, 10 minutes. I was becoming desperate. I closed my eyes and I said, Father, this is a seemingly stupid request, but it is a real need. I know that you know the password, <laughs> or some way for me to be able to get into the PC and unlock this. I know that you, the answer is, is with you. If you could please help me to retrieve this password, it would be a small miracle that will directly communicate to me that you're interested in me <laughs> and even in the small things in my life. And I ask please for this in your son's name. Amen. 
I opened my eyes and blinked a little. You know, a few seconds after I had said that amen, the answer was a million miles away. And into my mind popped a password from a dim and distant time. Fingers quivering, I typed <laughs> this password and lo and behold, the little wheels started spinning around and the words welcome <laughs> appeared on the screen. As I say, before I had prayed, the answer was a million miles away, but after a sincere and simple prayer, the answer was immediate. I sat there looking at the screen in complete awe at 11.30 in the evening, and I won't lie to you, a tear welled up in my eyes. While my family slept, and it was now around 11.30, the answer to something I'd been searching for for about four and a half hours suddenly came to mind. No one can tell me that this was not an answer to my prayer. A small miracle from Almighty God to me. We worship a powerful and a mighty God, the creator of planet Earth. And all its phenomenal splendor. Look at that marble. A God who created the continents and all their varieties divided the land from the sea. He's created the mighty waterfalls, the beautiful tapestry of the earth in which we inhabit. The colors overwhelm us. Don't those colors look magnificent? Breathtaking coming in from um, Cincinnati through here at beautiful time of the year, seeing the, the trees as they change color. The diversity and the complexity. And they even warm our hearts, a creation of God, with the color, the genius behind it the infinite superiority of the mind of the great creator God. A being so complex that there are no words to describe how intelligent he is in the English language, at least. Maybe there's another language that can do it. He numbers the stars, he calls them by name, and he creates things like that. It's just phenomenal. He does mighty things that our humanly devised languages are ill-equipped to fully describe. Mighty things for an incomparable or incomparable genius who helped me retrieve a password on my computer. Please turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, if you would. 2 Kings 6. Here we have a time where a group known as the Sons of the Prophets, sometimes tra translated the Company of the Prophets, were talking with God's prophet, Elisha. Apparently, apparently there were groups of prophets at the time, perhaps something akin to our ministerial trainees that we have today, groups of guys getting around trying to learn the ropes. Anyway, apparently this group had outgrown their current um, accommodation, and so they needed a bigger place in which to stay. Notice here in verse 1, 2 Kings 6 verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan, and let every man take a beam from there, and let us make there a place where we may dwell. And so Elisha said, Go, yeah, go, go for it, boys on your way. And then one said, no, 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 please, please, consent to go with your servants. We don't want to do this all by ourselves. We'd like you along. They must have been very close to him and felt a closeness, perhaps different to the way Elijah was as a personality. And so he answered, I will go. And he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe fell into the water and he cried out and he said alas master for this one was borrowed and so the man of God said where did it fall you know the story don't you and he showed him a place so he cut off a stick and he threw it in there and he made the iron float 
And therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took it. The young man had a development that he wished hadn't developed. He'd had iron fall into the stream. There it is, kasplosh. He'd organized with someone to borrow an axe, and he hadn't prepared carefully. The situation being described here was as a result of negligence. That's why this happened. He probably should have sat the axe in a bucket of water. You know how you do that before you're about to do a job? You sit the axe for a night, overnight, before you're ready to swing that thing, and the wood swells up and it holds the axe head firmly. But he didn't, and it was a mistake on his part. Much like me forgetting to keep an accurate record of passwords. Have you ever borrowed someone else's tools? Now, ladies, you might be short somewhat on personal experience, although there are tools in the kitchen, that's for sure. The universal rule is you break it, you either fix it, or you get a new one. Everyone knows that, right? There's no other option, and although there was a handle that could be returned, well, there's not much you can do with a handle, right, if you're trying to chop down a tree. So this is how the incident plays out. Now imagine if you were a parent of one of these prophets. You can imagine him coming home, oh, you're not going to believe what happened, the axe head fell in the, the drink, you know, I'm in trouble. And the parent, I can imagine a parent would say, well, that'll serve you right. You should have been more careful. You should have been more careful and astute. I think it's a valuable lesson for a young person. Maybe that's how most parents would would handle it. You have to save up, go down to the blacksmith, get a new handle, a new uh, head, and attach it to that handle. And replace it exactly as it was. And so, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, caused the heavy iron axe head to float. To float to the top where it could be reclaimed and, I assume, <laughs> reattached to the handle. Now, while I think this event would have been the topic of conversation for weeks after, can you imagine it, you know, it must have been months, maybe years, and it would have reaffirmed Elisha as God's servant and true prophet. Why do you think God did this? Why do you think God did it? There are many, many needs around the world, people asking to be healed from life-threatening diseases, people asking for, for comfort in times of extreme stress. We just heard of a death in the, in the congregation. And we pray to God for comfort. Even basic daily needs of food and shelter, and there are so many who, who need that around the world. A myriad of miracles that needed and need to be done. But of all the miracles that God could do, he rescues an axe head. God causes an iron axe head to float on water. And he helps me retrieve a lost password. Let's go to John chapter 2, if you would. John chapter 2, here we have the scene, the famous scene of the wedding at Cana of Galilee, in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus, his mother, and his disciples were invited. John chapter 2, and I want to begin reading in verse 3. John 2 verse 3 says, And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And Jesus makes a point here that it wasn't his time to start performing miracles. His hour had not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. <laughs> she was used to him doing certain things. Now, verse 6, there were six, set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purif purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. 
And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, verse 10, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, but you have kept the good wine until now. I'd love to have tasted some of that. This, verse 11, beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Yeah, everybody's enjoying themselves at the wedding. They're having a wonderful time. And as people do at weddings, kicking up their heels, probably a few dances, some bites to eat. And lo and behold, we've run out of wine. Oh dear. Whose fault was that? Was it Jesus' fault that they'd run out of wine? Was he to blame for the predicament? Why not make the same point as the axe head? Well, it was your own silly fault. You didn't prepare enough. You should have thought about it. You should have thought it through. No, instead we have water being turned into wine. A small miracle. Jesus declares to his mother, my hour has not yet come, and then promptly goes about doing as his mother asked. The almighty Son of God, the creator of earth and all that's in it, begins the signs, the signs that he was the Son of God by changing the nature or the substance of water and instead making it superb alcoholic wine. Now, why did Jesus do that? Why would he do that? I think you could argue that it really wasn't a necessity. I mean, we're not asking for something important like a dramatic healing. It seems to me that it wasn't an important thing that needed to be done. I even wonder if this miracle may have led to some partaking of uh, a little too much stumbling home. Maybe they could have hurt themselves on the, trip, trick, on the trip back home. Remember, it was said 20 or 30 litres. If we take 25 as an average, then we're talking about roughly 160 gallons of the absolute choicest wine. <laughs> Why the water into wine? Why the floating axe head? Why help with the missing password? Let's go to Deuteronomy 29, if you would. Deuteronomy 29, here we have Moses talking to all Israel. He's recounting how God did great things for them, delivering them from challenge after challenge. Now Moses called in verse 2, Deuteronomy 29, Moses called all Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders, the great big miracles like, you know, crossing the Red Sea, the famous shot, and the drowning of the whole army. Yet the Lord, verse 4, has not given you a heart to perceive and the eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. <clears throat> in my mind's eye, I imagine a couple of Israelites sitting around the campfire and one looks down at his feet. He turns to his friend, his mate next to him, and he says, you know, I don't think I've ever had a pair of sandals wear this well before. <laughs> and then, then his mate comes to the realization that, come to think of it, neither have I. A year goes by, and they notice that there's absolutely no wear on the sandals. 
In fact, year after year goes by, and after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, neither their shoes nor their clothes wore out the sandals. Now, some ladies might not like that idea. A girl's got to accessorize, right? <laughs> but it's a very simplified <laughs> wardrobe, isn't it? Now, we might say, if it were up to me, I'd have let them wear out. You know, give them one pair to set them on their way, and then, you know, let them learn to be a bit resourceful. They got one new pair, and as with all things, you know, they need to learn a lesson that things wear out and they've got to be replaced. But that's not what happened, is it? God helped them at the bottom level of their lives. The thing that separated their feet from the ground didn't wear out in 40 years. An axe head floats, water's turned into wine, sandals that don't wear out in 40 years, and a password that comes to mind after a sincere prayer. What are we to learn from this? Well, I suggest time spent this week on your own thinking what we might learn from this would be time well spent. But I have a couple of ideas as to why, which I'll share with you as well. The first of these answers can be found in Matthew 10. What are we to learn from things like this? Matthew chapter 10, let's read the words of Jesus himself. And in verse 29, Matthew 10 verse 29. And it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will but the very hairs of your head are numbered do not fear therefore you are of more value than many sparrows sometimes there may be a tendency for us to think that God doesn't really care about the details of my life. Some may, believe, may be led to believe that he's a bit absent, maybe a bit cold. I mean, doesn't he know that I am hurting deeply at the moment? We might be inclined to think that the all-powerful God isn't concerned with the minutia, you know, the small details of my life. I'm just one guy walking around on the earth. Well, example after example tells that this is simply not the case. If you ask God, how many hairs, really, how many hairs are there on my head? Do you think he'd know? If we said, God, worldwide, how many sparrows bit the dust yesterday? Do you think he'd know? It's a good question to ask ourselves. That's what it says in the book. The answer to both, I believe, is a resounding yes. Yes, he would know. He would know. And so the first reason as to why God has recorded in his word why he intervenes in our lives, I suggest to you, is that he wants to know, he wants us to know, that he's interested in the details of our life. Our individual lives, God is interested in. His word confirms that. There's an awareness from the point of view of God of the tiniest details of your life and mine. He understands our smallest need. The simplest things that you might need and want, God has an awareness of. The things that are important to you, the things that can change your life, the things that can make it better or worse. God proves through these small miracles that he's tied up in and interested in the smallest details of our lives. He can take care of an axe head that drops into the river. 
He can take care of my daily needs day by day. I'd like us to consider another familiar scripture, but from the perspective of small miracles. It's mentioned in Matthew 6. Let's have a look in Matthew 6. This is the model prayer that we're going to read, just part of it. Matthew chapter 6, and let's begin in verse 9. It says, In this manner therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Have you considered this in the context of the small miracles that for you and I, our daily bread is a small miracle? Ask a person from sub-Saharan Africa, you know, where poverty and hunger is at record highs. Ask them if they think our daily bread that we enjoy in Australia and here in America isn't a small miracle. We wake up each day, we open the fridge door, and we have total confidence that there will be something waiting for us in the morning, don't we? We really do. In fact, we're so confident that our daily bread will be provided for that we often neglect to pray for it, even though Jesus, in the model prayer, tells us to. Small things that need in to be done day in and day out we should ask God for. Why would God ask us to do that? Didn't he know that in Australia and America we'd be all okay, we'd be sweet, and we wouldn't need to ask for daily bread? Perhaps we forgot that in the asking for these things, of course, both physical and spiritual, we forget to acknowledge him as the source of these things. And in not asking, we may end up thinking that it's our right to have three squares a day. God must be involved in absolutely every part of our lives. And this is why God performs these small miracles in our lives. He wants us to involve him in the daily activities of our lives. A final reason as to why God answers, answers our prayers and our requests with small miracles is perhaps the most important and encouraging reason of all. Let's go to Exodus 34, one of my favorite passages of scripture that I'm really pleased to be able to share with you today. Exodus 34 and in verse 5, I want to begin reading. Exodus 34 God's declaration of himself. And this is what he says of himself, beginning in verse 5. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Verse 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. What, what kind of a picture do we get of our great God when we read verses and words such as this? Well, I think we can see from those verses that God is incredibly gracious. Incredibly gracious. When we read the story of the axe head, a natural reaction might be, well, you know, that problem occurred because people were careless. They didn't think it through. It would have been a good lesson for the young prophet to learn to be careful. You know, put the little wooden chucks, whatever you call those little, you know, those things, hammer them into the end of the, the axe head before you use it. The same goes for the water into wine. Why answer the request? Better to learn a lesson at the wedding supper and the ceremony. You know, that'll teach them to be more careful. But when we consider how gracious 
God was to the people involved. We're, we're greatly encouraged, aren't we? We're greatly encouraged by this kind of, of loving kindness. At this level, this level of detail that God went to. And I suggest it makes our difficulties a little more tolerable because a loving Father knows what's best for us. Isn't it comforting and endearing that a loving God is willing to act like that? When we consider that God is interested in the small details of our lives, that he wants to be involved in our lives and he wants us to include him in all aspects of our lives and how he graciously deals with us as a loving father. You know, David wrote in Psalm 103 verse 10, he said, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. He deals very graciously with us. How then should you and I respond? Well, as a final thought and in answer to the question, I'd like to point out another small miracle. Something small that Jesus did, and it can be found in Mark chapter 11. Let's go to Mark chapter 11, and here we have Jesus walking with his disciples. What should our response be, given these three points? Mark chapter 11, and then we'll start in verse 12. It says, now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree, a fig tree having leaves. And he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In verse 14, in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Notice verse 20. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. This is a small miracle. And I bring it up in the sermon here as a real contrast to the other miracles that we covered. Christ was very serious about this fig tree. Having walked up to it, carefully, you know, considered it, studied it. He had to conclude that the early signs showed that there was going to be no fruit on that fig tree. It looked good, perhaps from afar, but it wasn't going to produce. And he came to that conclusion. In verse 21, and Peter, remember, remembering, said, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away uselessness invited disaster a fig tree must produce figs and when we consider how God is aware at the minute level of our lives I think we realize via this small miracle that a Christian must be producing fruit the result of not doing so well results in being cut down God makes an investment in every one of the people that he calls into his truth. And that, of course, is you and me. The result of not doing so results in something we may not want. You may have noticed that I, before when we were in Exodus 34, I didn't read the last part of verse 7. If you're astute, maybe you noticed that. I did so purposefully, because in Exodus 34, verse 7, it, it concludes the verse by saying, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. God's small miracles... They require a response from you and me to depart from sin 
and to produce figs. The Almighty God, the maker of the earth and heaven and all that is in it, the rescuer of axe heads and passwords, <laughs> the fortifier of sandals and clothes, the maker of exquisite wine in short order. He does this, among other things, because he's interested in the details of our lives. And he wants to be involved in these details as a gracious and loving father. Isn't that incredibly encouraging? The question for us is, will we involve him and in turn produce the fruit that he expects from us? Remember the small miracles.